Hello everyone, welcome to my messy studio. My name is Mark and I'm an artist and an art professor. And in this video, we're going to discuss one of the oldest and best technologies for drawing with ink, widely used by the old masters well into the 19th century, the quill. I'm going to show you how to semi-easily turn a goose feather into an incredibly sensitive and expressive drawing instrument and demonstrate why, even with the remarkable technological advancements of our day and age, it's still worth using. Let's get started. Those of you that are familiar with my channel know that a large part of my content is informed by my deep love of the old masters and traditional materials and techniques. However, most of the materials I use are completely modern and nothing like what was used by many of the artists I so admire. Part of it is the difficulty and expense of procuring authentic materials, which in some instances are just no longer available. Part of it is the often superior performance of modern materials, which benefit from modern material science and manufacturing methods. And the fact is, many artists today fetishize traditional materials, not realizing how often the masters had to overcome the deficiencies of what they were using, and that their towering achievements were often created despite their materials rather than because of them. That said, there are instances when traditional materials are still, in some ways, superior to modern ones, are cheap and easy to procure, and with a little know-how, easily incorporated into your artistic practice. The quill is just such a material. It might surprise you to learn that the metal dip pen, which seems so old-fashioned, is a relatively recent invention being developed in the first half of the 19th century and not widely adapted by artists until towards the end of it, when the technology had fully matured. This means that most of the old master pen and ink drawings we love and admire were done with a bird feather, sometimes with a crow or a swan, but most commonly from a goose. This seems remarkable considering the calligraphic precision of the line work and the perfect control over ink flow, but it's the case. And while our modern dip pens and fountain pens can reproduce many of the effects we see in these drawings, the humble quill can do things their modern counterparts struggle to achieve. So what are the advantages of the quill over fountain pens or metal dip pens? The first is performance. Just look at what the quill is capable of. It can be used with tremendous calligraphic precision, such as in this incredible anatomy study by Rubens. It can also be used with extreme speed and lightness of touch, such as in this drawing by Tiepolo. Can such effects be attained with modern instruments? Perhaps. Much of what makes these drawings successful, of course, is the skill of the artist. But the sharp, flexible metal nibs required to match those strokes would catch and spatter on the rough handmade paper of the period, so a much smoother hot press surface would have to be used, and the effect would be much more mechanical. And there lies the real advantage of the quill. The lines it produces do not have the mechanical sharpness of their metal counterparts, and that imperfection gives the drawing a warmth and liveliness that cannot be matched by a metal instrument. Besides that, another advantage is the quill's complete and total customizability. While modern dip pen nibs and fountain pens come in a huge variety of flexibility, line weight, ink flow, and smoothness, you'll have to search long and hard to get something that suits you, and even then it'll not be perfect, and you'll have to meet the nib halfway meaning that to some extent you'll have to adjust to the nib rather than the nib having to adjust to you. A quill, on the other hand, can be cut exactly to your liking, with the ability to adjust the line weight, smoothness, flexibility, and even flow. Yet another advantage is that quill nibs need almost no pressure to make a line, which means that you barely have to make contact with the paper. This allows the nib to glide over the page with minimal resistance, even on rough handmade papers. The feeling is really unlike anything you've experienced and can be disconcerting if you're used to the feedback provided by a metal nib, even one that's polished glass smooth. But with little practice, you can become accustomed to the lack of feedback and the speed with which you can use the quill. And the last advantage is that the quill is wonderfully flexible and responsive, allowing you to achieve line variation as snapback that makes most metal nibs blush with envy. And while many very flexible metal nibs have to be used slowly to create that line variation, that is not the case with the quill, which excels when used quickly. There are, of course, disadvantages to the quill, and the most obvious is that you have to make them, but that should not deter anyone. Purchasing the raw materials is easy enough nowadays, and I was able to buy a package of 25 large goose feathers quite inexpensively for around $10. And making the quill, as you will see, is not such a difficult task, requiring only a quick curing stage and, of course, the cutting. The other disadvantage is that quills wear out much faster than metal dip pens, but this is dependent on how you prepare them, use them, as well as the paper they're being used with. Prior to the 19th century, paper was made out of cotton or linen fibers, resulting in a softer, less abrasive surface more suitable to the use of the quill. The majority of paper today is made out of wood pulp, which unfortunately is more abrasive and wears out a quill faster. 
Fortunately for us, papers using the older manufacturing method are still widely available, which is why I'm going to use this very nice handmade paper from the Canadian paper manufacturer St. Armand. In short, with proper use and the correct paper, you'll find the quill quite resilient to wear. And in fact, one 18th century author boasted of having completed an entire manuscript using a single quill. Another more daunting disadvantage is that accurate information on how to make a proper quill is often scant and vague, with historical treatises often briefly touching on the subject. Cennini, for example, in his Craftsman's Handbook, dedicates a short single paragraph to it. Fortunately for us, much of this information is preserved not by artists, but by calligraphers and historical reenactors, and I was able to glean enough information together from a variety of online resources, the links to which I'll leave below. The most daunting disadvantage, and the one that will be the most difficult to overcome, isn't the lack of know-how when it comes to making a quill, but the fact that we all grew up in the era of the ballpoint pen, and are simply not used to handling something so delicate and flexible. I've been drawing with a pen for over three decades, and am comfortable using the most flexible of steel pens. And even I, when I first encountered the quill, thought it was insanely difficult to control. But this is simply an issue of practice, and I'm going to give you some advice to improve your ability to work with a quill. For now, let's deal with getting a well-functioning quill into your hands. Before I show you how to make a quill, here is everything you're going to need. The first is a goose feather. Larger quills are made from the first four flight feathers of birds, like turkeys, geese, and swans, with crow feathers used for smaller quills, which by the way is why fine metal nibs used for detailed drawing are still called crow nibs. For our purposes, I'm going to use goose feathers since they are the most commonly used, and fortunately for us, are still the most commonly available now. You can buy such feathers inexpensively online from Etsy or Amazon, though their quality can be questionable, and there might be specialty shops selling higher quality feathers out there. While well, I'm sure the original quality of the feather is important, I believe the correct tempering process is what ultimately determines the quality of the pen. For the tempering process, we're going to need some sand and a metal container to heat it. This can be a tin can, but in this case I'm using this copper cup. For the cutting, you're going to need an X-Acto knife or some kind of sharp box cutter. Make sure you have a bunch of new blades for it, because it needs to stay super, super sharp. We're also going to need a little narrow stick, like a brush handle, but here I'm using this bamboo chopstick. You're also going to need a very hard cutting surface with no give to it. Traditionally, this used to be a piece of glass, and I've also seen an old credit card being used for this purpose. In my case, I'm going to use the back of this chopstick, since bamboo is very hard, but won't damage my cutting edge the way glass might. By the way, painting it black will allow you to better see the quill when you cut it. And last, to apply the finishing touches to the nib, you're going to need a little piece of 1000 grit sandpaper. This is useful for the final shaping stage where you fine tune the width of your point, and also to give the point a little bit of extra smoothness. Now that we have our supplies, on to the tempering process. The first step is to soak the quill shafts in water overnight. Some instructions say that this step is optional, but I think it's absolutely crucial, giving the quill flexibility. A quill after this stage will feel slightly squishy and easy to cut, but will be impossible to use because of its softness. To give the nib resilience and the ability to work for a long period of time, we need to heat temper it. There is no consensus on the heat tempering process, with James Watros in The Craft of Old Master Drawing prescribing placing the shaft of the quill in sand heated to 140 degrees for 5 minutes, and other resources giving alternative temperatures and times, as much as 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes. After experimenting with a few heat treatments, I found that 140 for 5 minutes does practically nothing to the quill, leaving it only slightly harder than before while 350 for 20 minutes was completely excessive, making the quills so brittle that they shattered with only a pinch. I found that 250 degrees Fahrenheit for about an hour until the sand returned to room temperature was about right. Once I got the sand to 250 degrees, I stirred it to make sure that the temperature was consistent throughout and there were no hot spots. Then I stuck a few feathers into the sand, being careful not to make contact with a cup which might burn the quill. After an hour, the quill will feel much harder than before, which is exactly the effect you're looking for. If you see yellow, or worse brown, you've overcooked the feather and can toss it right into the trash. Some tutorials say that you need to remove an outer membrane after the heat treatment, which is done with a light scraping. Perhaps this was already done with the feathers I purchased, but I didn't see any membrane to remove. These quills are fully tempered and feel hard with just a touch of give to them, and are ready to be cut. 
The first step is to trim down the nib and remove the barbs. This is not completely necessary, but they can impede the swift, accurate movements of the pen, as well as poke you in the eye. From paintings of people using quills, we see that in most cases, the feathers were generally entirely trimmed before use. Though there are a few 19th century romantic depictions where the feathers are either entirely or partially intact. Cut the feather down to about 14 inches and then peel off the barbs by making a little incision in the back and stripping them off. Anything that refuses to come off can be cut away with a knife. The next step is to find the natural balance of the pen. This is done by simply holding and finding the natural orientation of the quill in your hand. Now that we have the correct orientation, it's time to go through the eight steps required to actually make a quill. Step one is to cut off the tip, which is too thin to be used. Holding the nib right side up, remove the first one eighth of an inch of the tip with a 45 degree angle cut. Yes, this cut might seem upside down, but you'll see the sense behind this in a second. Now you're going to create a slit. The best method to create it, in my opinion, is to start with a knife, making a tiny little cut by placing the tip of the X-Acto knife into the shaft and gently lifting up, creating a tiny 1 16th of an inch slit. Only a little cut is needed because in step three, we're going to extend it by inserting a thin rod like this chopstick, moving your thumbnail to where you want the slit to end, about a half an inch down, then gently lifting upward with the rod. With a little pressure, you'll hear a crack and see that the slit has extended. The slit might feel too long, but the initial cut portion of the slit will be removed as the tines are shaped, so you want to start with something a little longer. The next step is to flip the quill upside down and create your first angled cut. This should be done about an inch from the start of the slit and be about 15 degrees. Make sure the slit is facing directly down and is centered directly below where you make the cut. That will ensure that your slit will be centered, though if it's slightly off, don't worry because you can make adjustments to it later. At this stage, I also scrape away the fibrous material inside of the shaft using a small dental tool. This can also be done with the tip of your X-Acto knife. Step 5 is to cut the shoulders of the quill to form the tines. There is a great deal of possible variation here, with narrower and longer shoulders creating a more flexible nib, and shorter and wider shoulders creating a stiffer nib. I recommend keeping the tines short and stiff at the beginning, about a quarter of an inch, since the quill will most likely be way more flexible and responsive than you're used to. In paintings depicting this process, the quill is held with a point facing you, and a cut made by stabilizing the tip by placing the thumb against it, and then drawing the blade toward you in a pairing action. Well, I'm sure this is an effective method. For those just starting out, this will be a recipe for a trip to the ER. I recommend you always cut away from yourself, which I think is equally precise and not nearly as risky. You can direct the blade with your thumb like so, which gives you careful, slow control. Take your time and keep going until the tines are the same thickness and touch at a single point. The next step is the least forgiving and might cause you the biggest headache, which is to cut the tip of the nib. Place the quill upside down on a hard surface that has no give to it at all, and cut the tip at a 70 degree angle exactly perpendicular to the direction of the tines. In this case, again, I'm using a hard bamboo chopstick, which I painted black so I can see the tip of the nib better. Once the cut is done, I recommend looking at the tines through a magnifying glass to ensure that they're in perfect alignment. Those of you that draw with steel dip nibs or fountain pens are familiar with this process and understand the importance of nib alignment. This is no different. If the tines are the same length and the same width, then the last step is to gently run the pen against the 2000 grit sandpaper. Do this very gently and only one or two three times as to not wear down your point. Now it's time to try the pen, but first here is a very important tip that will make the quill much easier to control. Make sure that your drawing surface is tilted at about 45 degrees, which ensures a proper pen angle. Drawing on a flat surface forces you to hold the pen at a more vertical angle, which creates too much ink flow. A tilted drawing surface allows you to hold the quill at a lower angle, which slows down the ink flow, greatly improving the quill's performance. The pen should put down a thin, controlled line in every direction with just the faintest contact. If it doesn't, then you'll have to go back to the magnifying glass to see if the tines are in alignment. Once the pen works, you can adjust the line weight to your liking by running the shoulders against that 1000 grit sandpaper. Go little by little and remember that you're not dealing with a steel pen. A few passes on the sandpaper should give you the line weight you need. 
One thing you might find is that the shaft of the quill is too narrow to hold comfortably since our fingers are no longer used to holding such things. A little bit of tape wrapped at your optimal distance from the tip to form a wider grip section will give you more control. The paintings show the quills are gripped fairly close to the tip, which is where I recommend you place your grip section. Then you can remove the tape and move it up the shaft as you use up the quill. Yes, it's ugly, but if you're drawing for hours at a time, comfort is way more important. Here's my quill ready to draw, and it only took a few minutes, not counting the curing stage, which can be done in bulk. The process is relatively forgiving other than the very last cut, which has to be precise. But I imagine that artists of the past, having used the quill daily since childhood, had such complete mastery that they could prepare one to their liking in less time than it would take us to sharpen a pencil. The quill will naturally hold enough ink to put down a few strokes. The time between dips can be extended slightly by roughening up the inside of the shaft with an X-Acto knife. But to make the pen write much longer between dips, there is a very neat thing I'd like to show you. Something I learned from a book by the esteemed calligrapher Edward Johnson, titled Writing, Illuminating, and Lettering, published in 1906. A little strip of steel can be inserted into the shaft to act as an ink reservoir. Since I don't have sheets of steel lying around, I may do with aluminum from a can. After cutting a little sheet, I sanded both sides, mostly for aesthetics, and then cut a strip about 1 16th of an inch by 1 inch. One half of this strip is curved into a loop, and the other side is curved slightly into an S. Then you can use your X-Acto knife to push everything in until the tip of the reservoir sits 1 8th of an inch behind the tip of the quill. And voila! You have a fantastic ink reservoir that quadruples the amount of drawing you can do without re-dipping. As previously mentioned, I'm working on a handmade paper from Saint Armand, a type of paper that would commonly be used for drawing before the 19th century. Unfortunately, the ink I'm using is a modern formulation, a burnt umber, acrylic-based ink made by Liquitex. I actually bought some traditional Bister ink from Kremer Pigments and was going to introduce it in this tutorial. But I found it hard to work with since it clumped up if it wasn't continuously stirred and making this video was complicated enough without the headache of working with a poorly behaved historical ink. The first impression I had when using the quill is its obvious lightness as a drawing implement. As someone used to working with dip nib holders and fountain pens, this was disconcerting. What's worse, my last few weeks were spent drawing with an incredibly heavy fountain pen made almost entirely from copper, which felt more like a paperweight than a drawing tool. The other thing that feels strange is how I barely have to make contact with the paper to put down a line. Since there's almost no resistance, the hand is free to move as it wants. It's a strange feeling, as if instead of a pen, I'm working with a super thin brush that's gliding across the paper. And remember, the paper here is textured, and yet the pen glides over it without a hitch. One of the great things about the quill, of course, is its tremendous flexibility. This is dependent on how you carve it, but you can make the tines long enough to get huge line variation that many metal pens would absolutely struggle with. And because of the light and springy nature of the material, it snaps back with remarkable speed. Yes, steel nibs nowadays can reproduce such effects, but usually that kind of flex will feel slightly squishy, meaning that there will be a slight delay returning to normal width, whereas with a quill, the snapback is lightning fast. The earliest use of the quill dates back to the 2nd century BC, when it was used to write some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, the predominant writing implement in ancient times was the reed pen, and the quill isn't mentioned until the 6th century AD by St. Isidore, the Bishop of Seville, and its use didn't become widespread in Europe until the late Dark Ages. Compared to the reed pen, the quill has the advantage of flexibility and durability, allowing for a finer point, and therefore for a larger variety of script types. Its adoption in Europe was concurrent with a switch from papyrus to vellum as a writing surface, the latter having a smoother, more consistent surface, better suited for smaller, more decorative writing styles. From the Middle Ages onward, we have countless fine examples of the quill used not only for incredibly intricate lettering, but also sophisticated and skilled drawing, and it's clear that the use of pen and ink by artists of the Renaissance was no innovation, but rather a continuation of a highly refined, centuries-old tradition. The number of artists from the Renaissance to the 19th century that were masters of the quill makes it extremely difficult to select just a few. But to further impress upon you the extreme versatility of the quill, here are two that you might not be as familiar with. 
The first is Antonio Pisano, known as Pisanello, an early Renaissance artist from Pisa, whose delicate, intricately hatched drawings demonstrate the extreme precision with which the quill can be used, easily matching and actually surpassing anything that can be done with a modern steel nib. And then, on the other end, stylistically, we have the work of the Venetian Rococo painter Giambattista Tiepolo, whose playful, deftly executed drawings demonstrate the quill's ability to glide, skip, and dance over the paper, effortlessly putting down thick and thin lines with a freedom and expressiveness that, again, no modern drawing tool can match. For much of the history of the quill, tempering was done through air drying, a process that took up to a year. Then, in the 1700s, a method was developed in the Netherlands that greatly sped up the tempering process. The English scientist Michael Faraday described the process, called Dutching, in an article published in 1835. The method was quite elaborate, involving the submersion of quills in damp soil, then a heating stage, immediately after which the quill was crushed flat, rendering it seemingly useless, followed by yet another heat treatment which reshaped the quill to previous form. Once the quills were tempered, they would be cut by trained craftsmen who, according to the article, could cut over 1,200 quills in a day. It may seem surprising that quill production was done on such a massive industrial scale, but consider the rapid spread of literacy in Europe in the 1800s and that the quill was the dominant writing and drawing instrument. The demand for quills in England alone was such that the native geese could not keep up and 20,000 pounds of feathers a year had to be imported from Poland and Russia. Another surprising thing is that quills were regularly sold pre-cut in stationery shops. By the end of the 18th century, advances in metallurgy led to the creation of metal pens, but mass production wasn't possible until industrial processes were developed in the 19th century to create a consistent, well-performing product. Artists were slow to abandon the quill, but the technology for manufacturing metal nibs continued to improve until by the end of the 19th century, their consistency, durability, and flexibility was such that the quill became obsolete. First, let's acknowledge that there are good reasons why the quill has gone the way of the dodo. Modern drawing instruments offer convenience and consistency that a quill simply cannot match. Steel dip pens come ready-made, and in a huge variety, and can take months of steady use to wear out. Felt tip markers that many artists use for line work are portable and work on every surface. And don't get me started on the convenience and versatility of fountain pens, my favorite drawing instrument. Furthermore, just making a quill that works well takes practice, and your first attempt might be scratchy and splotchy, and at worst, not work at all. And even if you do make one that works well, getting to the point where you can make a functioning quilt quickly and consistently will take considerable time. And then, of course, is the main issue. That artists today, no matter how skilled, are heavy-handed creatures accustomed to drawing tools that are far less responsive. This is an instrument that we're just not used to, and acquiring the proficiency it takes to use it confidently is a process that for most of us might take years. So why bother when you can just pick up a modern tool? I've already mentioned the advantages that the quill has in drawing, the ability for it to be tuned exactly to your preference, the smoothness, the responsiveness, the tremendous flexibility. However, the only way to be truly convinced is for you to go through the pains of trying it. But I'm confident that once you do and make a proper quill and use it, a switch will turn on in your head. In addition, for those of us that love art history and old master drawing, this is an opportunity to experience the exact methods that were used by the masters to make their masterpieces, giving us a deeper appreciation of their achievements. I hope all of you found this tutorial useful and are inspired to give this a shot, because I think this is a wonderful way of drawing that truly deserves to be revived. While I love my fountain pens and will never stop using them or making videos about them, the quill allows me to do things they cannot. But beyond the purely technical, drawing with a quill connects me to the past, bringing me closer to the way the masters lived, worked, and thought, which in turn inspires me to do my best work. Thanks so much for watching, and see you back here in my messy studio very soon. Bye-bye.